Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Crestor or Rosuvastatin. This is a drug that's in the statin family. It reduces your cholesterol, your total cholesterol, your bad cholesterol. It increases your good cholesterol. It decreases your triglycerides and supposedly makes you live happily ever after. Well, it's the seventh statin that's marketed in the United States. It gained marketing approval in 2003. It actually was developed by the Shinoji Pharmaceutical Corporation of Osaka, Japan. And then the marketing rights were purchased by AstraZeneca. This is a drug when diet and exercise don't work. Sales of the statin drugs gone off the roof, off the chart. In 2012, the total sales for the statin drugs was $17 billion, $5 billion for this drug, Crestor. They keep changing the indications for the drug. Originally, it was about 20% of the population between 40 and 75 years of age. Then they increased that to about 37%. Then they increased that to 50%. And now, basically, the indication is if you're a man and you're over 50, a woman over age 60, chances are you make the grade. You should be taking a statin, or at least so they say, in spite of the fact that probably half of the people who are given prescriptions are going to stop taking them within the first year because they're afraid of the side effects or they develop the side effects or they forget to take or they say, hey, I'm not even sick. I don't need to take a drug. Well, what are the indications? The indications are you've had a heart attack or a stroke or some sort of cardiovascular event, maybe angina or had a stent or bypass surgery, or your bad cholesterol is in excess of 190. That's called secondary prevention, when you've already had some kind of event. But now what they're doing is they're saying, hey, it might slow the progression of atherosclerosis. So if you've got atherosclerosis, let's give you the pill. And they've gone even further. They say, let's use it for primary prevention. Let's use it, like I said, in people who are over age 50 or over age 60 if you're a woman, and you have a risk factor or anybody who has significant risk. Maybe you're a cigarette smoker, maybe you have diabetes, maybe you're overweight. Well, the question is, are we really going to benefit those people or not? And the answer is that the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, has now widely recommended these drugs. They've widely recommended these drugs because they say they will prevent, prevent the development of cardiovascular disease. We'll see about that. The situation has become so confused that the United States Preventive Services Task Force, the group that is responsible for setting health guidelines in the United States, threw their hands up basically and they took down all of the recommendations they made up to 2014 because it's gotten so confusing and so controversial. The only thing they say is there's no indication, no specific indication in favor of or against anybody getting their cholesterol between 20 and 40 years of age over that they make no recommendations at the present time. The old guidelines were you would drop the cholesterol down, the bad cholesterol, to a level of less than 100 or maybe less than 80 or less than 70. Lots of different guidelines out there that favor all of those numbers without any good evidence. But now the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association came up with the idea, hey, let's look at your risk. So we'll give it to everybody who's had some sort of arteriosclerotic coronary vascular disease. We'll give it to everybody whose cholesterol, bad cholesterol, is over 190. And for everybody else, we'll look at the risk. We'll look at the risk. And if it's more than 7.5% over the next 10 years, in other words, you have high blood pressure, you're a cigarette smoker, you have diabetes, well, you ought to be taking these kind of medicines. That's called primary prevention. The idea is that we can prevent some sort of event. Maybe we can, maybe we can't talk about that. So they did a study, and the study very recently done called the Jupiter study, looked at individuals, and these individuals were men over age 50, women over age 60, and they had at least one risk factor. They had one risk factor. Maybe they were cigarette smokers, or maybe they were overweight. Maybe they had high blood pressure. Maybe they had some kind of inflammatory disorder. And what they did is they looked at over 17,000, almost 18,000 individuals, men, as I say, over age 50, women over age 60. They didn't really have high cholesterol. Their bad cholesterol was less than 130. 
So at the present time, the optimal level is less than 100. The non-optimal level is between 100 and 130. Borderline is 130, 160. High is 160 to 190. And very high is over 90. So they're looking in this study that changed national policy at people who have optimal or above optimal, non-optimal level. And what they threw in, they did another test. They did a test called the high sensitivity C-reactive protein. It normally should be less than two. In these people, it was more than two. It was an average of about four. So what they did is they looked at the risk. They put the numbers in the calculator, just like we'll talk about in a moment, and they found that the 10-year risk was about 11 to 12 percent. Some of the people got Crestor, some of the people got a placebo, and they looked at the total outcome for combined disease. So they looked at the total number of people who died from coronary vascular disease, plus had heart attack, plus had stroke, plus had unstable angina, plus had to have some sort of revascularization, bypass surgery or a stent. That was considered, you had to get into that group to be considered an outcome. That's the primary outcome. And what they found was that there was such a dramatic change in the course of the study that they had to stop the study early. It was originally going to be about a five-year study. They stopped it after less than two years because they said there's just no question that Crestor is performing phenomenally well. How well was it performing? They said overall, if you add up all of those primary endpoints that I mentioned, the death, the heart attack, the stroke, the unstable angina, the revascularization, well, they said that there was a 44% reduction in the group getting the Crestor. Well, actually, tell you what, it wasn't because the LDL or the bad cholesterol was reduced. It seemed to be that it was the high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And the only benefit, the only group that benefited was when it was in excess of two and it fell to below two. Now, let's talk about this 44%, but let's look specifically, instead of at all of the factors, let's just pick one. Let's pick heart attacks. Everyone's afraid of a heart attack. You don't want a heart attack. So in the group that was receiving the placebo, 0.3% three percent had a heart attack during the course of the study. One-third of one percent in the group receiving the Crestor, it was a little less than 0.2 percent. So the drug company looked at those two numbers and said, oh my goodness, that's a reduction of 55 percent. 55 percent improvement. You got to take the Crestor. I think the rest of us might look at those numbers and say, hey, what is the difference between 0.3% and 0.17%? Now, they might get excited and say it's a 55% reduction, but you and I are probably going to look at that and say, hey, that's two-tenths of 1%, not even a half of a percent, not even a quarter of 1% reduction. With a medicine that costs about $10 a day, it doesn't make sense. Interestingly, the gentleman, the physician, the cardiologist, very well respected, who patented the high sensitivity C-reactive protein test, he suggested the study to the NIH. They said no. Suggested it to Bayer Pharmaceuticals. They said no. Suggested it to Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. They said no. Finally found one, AstraZeneca, that said, yeah, we'll support the study. So all the study really showed is not that the Crestor is going to benefit you, but that we're going to get a 0.2% benefit as far as heart attacks are concerned. That's what Crestor is supposed to do to you? Well, anyway, so what the current recommendations are is we don't care, supposedly, what the number of the LDL is after treatment. It's before treatment. And it's what are your risk factors. So if you have a lot of risk, we want a high intensity statin. Medium amount of risk, we want a medium strength statin. And low degree of risk, take a low potency statin. And that seems to be the way that we're going currently. So the people who've had 
a cardiac event or a vascular event, those people get the high intensity statins. People who have a statin, have a, have a bad cholesterol level, LDL level over 190, they get the high intensity. People who have diabetes between the ages of 40 and 75 maybe have some other kind of event as well who have a risk of more than 7.5% over the 10 years. They should take a medium potency statin. And people who don't have diabetes and have somewhat less risk, well, they have to, to take somewhat of a lower intensity statin. Now, the high intensity statins are going to lower the bad cholesterol somewhere in excess of 50%. The medium intensity statins lower it between 30 and 50%. Lower intensity statins, they're going to reduce it by somewhere around 30%. But the important thing that you should know is that if we look at some of the data, some people say that 7.5% number is made up. It should be 10%. Other people say, no, it should actually be 20%. Actually, they just changed the recommendation in Britain from more than 20% to around 10%. Well, how do we get the, this number? Where's the number 10% or 7.5%? Where is it originating? It originates with a calculator, and as a matter of fact, the calculator is probably wrong. It overestimates by somewhere between 75 and 150 percent the likelihood that you're going to have some sort of a vascular disease. But what it requires is that you put in your age, your gender, your blood pressure, your systolic blood pressure. Then you have to give them the number for your good cholesterol and your bad cholesterol. And then you add in your race, whether you're a smoker, whether you have diabetes, take aspirin, and that's going to give you the number, the risk that you have over 10 years, and that's supposedly going to put you in a category for the high intensity, medium intensity, low intensity statins. Well, uh, Crestor, depending on the dose, could be a low, a medium, or a high intensity statin. If we take a dose of 20 milligrams, it comes in 5, 10, 20, and 40 milligrams. We don't use 40 milligrams much anymore because it's increasingly associated with liver disease and with muscle disease. So the 20 milligrams for the overwhelming majority of people, that's the max. You've got to have a real good reason to do the 40. But if we do the 20 milligram, it's going to reduce the LDL by about a little more than 50%. At that same dose of Lipitor, we're going to reduce the bad cholesterol by about 40%, but we can increase the dose and in the basically the uh, same thing as the Crestor, or a little less potent would be the Zocor, which is called Simvastatin, or the Pravacol, even lower potency yet, which is also called Pravastatin. Well, the issue is, when you take the drug, what happens? Well, you take the drug, and about a third of it to 20% is going to get into the system. It's going to be metabolized a little bit in the liver and pushed out in the feces. It's going to stay in your body for about 19 hours. You can take it with food or without food. Actually, if you're Asian, you have to take half the dose because for some reason, genetically, Asians don't metabolize it the same way Caucasians do. And as a result, the concentration at the same dose is twice as high in Asians. So, uh, word of caution. Unlike the other statins, you can take this one with grapefruit juice or with grapefruit. The other statins, you can't. And you have to be a little careful. You don't want to take this one in some niacin, especially more than a gram a day. You don't want to uh, take it without precautions if you're taking warfarin. And if you have gout and taking colchicine, you might have a problem. If you're a pregnant woman or breastfeeding, again, don't take the drug. If you have significant liver disease, don't take the drug. How does the drug work? Well, it works in the liver by preventing the production of a chemical called mevalonate. And mevalonate is required to manufacture cholesterol. So no mevalonate, no cholesterol. And interestingly, not only does it work that way, but it also causes the liver cells to develop a lot of receptors. There's sort of that old lock and key story. Well, the lock is the receptor and the key is the floating around bad cholesterol and the bad cholesterol fits into the lock and the liver cell gobbles it up and then it drops the bad cholesterol. That's the way it's supposed to work. Now, do you get any side effects from taking the drug? Sure you do. 
you could have a headache or abdominal pain, nausea, weakness, and some people get sinusitis, itchiness, difficulty sleeping or nightmares, but some people are developing peripheral nerve conditions, numbness and tingling, and other people develop problem with cataracts, and then we have a group of people who are developing muscle-related disorders, and the muscle-related disorder can be something mild, you get some achiness or some tenderness of the muscles, but it could be you develop some cramps or actual breakdown of the muscle cells themselves. That's a dangerous condition we call rhabdomyolysis, and when that happens, the protein can block the kidneys, and then you can develop kidney problems, and then on top of that you can develop a significant assortment of conditions, and, and sometimes you're, you're awfully sick. So you do have to be careful if you develop muscle pain, muscle tenderness, or if your urine changes color or your skin changes color. Most at risk are people over age 65, people who have low active thyroid, people who have kidney problems, or people who are taking certain other kind of medicines. The likelihood of rhabdomyolysis is highest with Crestor, it's about eight times higher than it is with, say, taking Pravacol, about six times greater than it is taking the Lipitor, and twice as much as it is taking the Zocor. Well, after the drug became available to the general population, instead of just the small number of people that it was tested on, they found a series of other complications. It could decrease your platelet, it could cause hepatitis or liver failure, it could cause a problem again with those nerves, or it could cause enlargement of the male breast, or it could cause memory loss and forgetfulness and confusion. It was linked to diabetes in 2010, linked to those memory problems in 2012, and the memory problems could come on after a day of taking the medicine or as much as several years. Now, just because there's an association doesn't necessarily mean cause and effect. Well, what about this cholesterol lowering? Is it really important? Well, they looked in the Framingham Heart Study, and they found that between levels of 150 and 300, you couldn't really detect who was likely to have a heart attack and who wasn't likely to have a heart attack. Now, other studies have evaluated how much longer you live if you take a statin compared to if you don't take a statin. Well, if you've already had a heart attack, you can increase your life expectancy by taking a statin by about four days, actually four days and 45 minutes on average. Four days and 45 minutes, that's not very impressive taking a pill for 20 years. My God, you might spend more time going to the pharmacy and, and taking the pill and actually physically drinking it down then you do benefit that you get. And if you don't have any history of heart disease, you only increase your life expectancy on average by about three days and 15 minutes. Another study showed that if you had really severe vascular disease, you might increase your survival by as much as 27 days. Another study looked at 1,000 people who took the statins every day for five years, and they found that there were 11 fewer major vascular events in those 1,000 people who took the pill every single day for five years. They found that in the people taking placebo, 5.2% of them had a vascular event. In the group taking the Crestor, 4.1% had a vascular event. That's only a difference of 1%. That's not very impressive. Most studies look at the combined endpoints. They don't look at the heart disease or the stroke or the revascularization. And as I showed you before, when we look at the heart attack, that 55% drops way down to less than a quarter of 1%. The Cochrane study, very impressive group that everybody basically in medicine looks to, they looked at 11 studies of primary prevention. The primary prevention, remember, you don't have any heart attack, don't have any kind of problem, except maybe you're a smoker, maybe you're overweight, maybe you have high blood pressure. Now you take the statin. Well, what happened? They said nothing. There was no significant decrease in mortality. And when they looked at people after a cardiac event, again, they found it was very unimpressive. And as a matter of fact, so too. The expert review of clinical pharmacology, when it evaluated the evidence, they found that, hey, there really isn't any evidence to support people taking the statins. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And when they look at all of the trials since 2005, 
there's no consistent mortality benefit of taking the medicines. And as a matter of fact, there's underreporting of the adverse events. And a lot of these drug studies are funded by the pharmaceutical companies. And the pharmaceutical companies, unfortunately, don't even publish all of the data. And that's very troubling that we learn from the pharmaceutical industry. Now, supposedly, the highest risk patients, people who have the highest LDL, the elderly patients, people who have heart failure, people who have kidney problems, when they were given the medicines, again, a lot of studies show no benefit. The cholesterol treatment trialists looking at 27 cholesterol reducing medicine studies. And what they found was there was a little bit of a decrease in the cardiovascular event, no decrease in the mortality. And people who have diabetes, no decrease in the mortality. And the Eli Lilly company came up with a new drug, and it was called Evacetribid. And Evacetribid dramatically reduced the bad cholesterol, dramatically increased the good cholesterol and was associated with no difference in the heart attack or stroke. No significant benefit. If you want to do something, you might want to consider the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet, just go look it up on the computer. And you will find that a change in your diet may well be associated with significant benefit. One of the original studies showing this was known as the Lyon Diet Heart Study. And it showed a 7-0% decrease in the risk of heart disease after a period of just 27 months. Fewer deaths, fewer heart attacks. And interestingly, no change in the cholesterol. Hmm. So we made a little fun of some of the numbers before saying that, well, 70% reduction or 55% reduction might not mean much. Here it means a significant amount. So the reduction in death from cardiovascular disease on the Mediterranean diet in the Lyon diet study went from a controlled diet 5% to the Mediterranean diet of 1%. Now that's a 4% plus difference. That's a significant difference. Mediterranean diet has a lot of fruit and vegetables and nuts, cuts out a lot of the junk that we tend to eat here in the United States. It uses a lot of olive oil, cuts down on the salt, cuts down basically on the meat, lots of wine, lots of other things that you would enjoy, but unfortunately no junk food. Well, Crestor. Crestor is a drug that had about 20 million prescriptions in 2015, $5 billion in worldwide sales. It rated as the number two most prescribed medicine here in the United States. It brought in one-fifth of all of the revenues to AstraZeneca, but the patent was nearing an end in 2016, and the company wanted to keep the generics off the market because they said they'd lose $400 million in revenue. They'd have to lay some people off. They'd have to cut the research budget. And remember, with this research budget, they didn't develop the Crestor. It was developed by the Shinoji Pharmaceutical Company in Japan. So what they did is they said, ah, we can do a study. And we can do a study on a couple kids, because if we can get some approval for a special indication in these rare kids who had a condition known as the homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, where the cholesterol is sky high, if we can show that we get some benefit, and if the FDA approves us, then we get a special elongation, a prolongation of our patent. And that's what they did. And they told the FDA, we want the prolongation of the patent. And if you have the drug patented and it's extended, then the generics have to use the same label. But now none of the generics have shown that they're beneficial for this new condition that the AstraZeneca company did. Well, it gets to be a technical and a legal matter. Of course, it went to court, and the court said, what are you talking about? No, you can't have any extension of the patent. We want the generics on the market. We want the drug price to fall. The drug price is 10 bucks a day, basically, if you're taking this. And, and the 
as a matter of fact, this good company uh, settled with the Foreign Corruption Practices Act in 2016 on some, what, what some people might say are unethical issues that were going on in China and in Russia. Well, now the generics are available, so the price is down. But you still have to be careful, because if you go over to the drugstore and you have the prescription, they have what's called sticky pricing. So the drugstore isn't necessarily bound to give you the cheapest price. What is the cheapest price of the drug? Well, if you get the generic, you go over to Costco or somewhere like that, it's going to be less than $20 a month. On the other hand, if you go to some of the other places, if you go to Walgreens, it might be $60 a month for the generic. On the other hand, if you want the name brand, I want the Crest or I don't want any generic, it's going to cost you $10 plus a day cash. But the drug company says, we'll give you a copay card, so we'll stick it to the insurance company and you don't have any copay. So what would you rather do, pay Costco 18 bucks or pay us nothing? And that's part of the reason why your insurance is so expensive. Well, just remember when we're talking about the statin-reducing drugs, some trials, some trials show that the prolongation of life is only going to be in the matter of less than a week. That's very unimpressive. Studies clearly show and routinely show if you're a cigarette smoker and you give up the habit and you're 30 years old, you will gain 10 years, not less than a week, but 10 years. If you're age 60 and you give up cigarette smoking, you'll gain three years of life expectancy. So your destiny is in your own hands. Remember, we've shown that you can reduce your risk significantly without changing your cholesterol. So cholesterol is only part of the story. And to learn more about the story, go to the video I did on Lipitor and watch that. But remember, if you want to benefit you must change your diet, you must change your lifestyle, you must get off the cigarettes. If you're drinking more than a couple alcoholic beverages a day for a man, one or more for a woman, you better cut down. Those things are going to take a toll on your heart. And your diet? Well, probably the recommended diet is not the best. Probably a diet that has a high amount of protein, a high amount of fat, and a low amount of carbohydrate, especially the simple carbohydrates, okay for the complex carbohydrates, lots of fruit and vegetables, lots of nuts, but be careful of the simple carbohydrates. And if you do that, you'll be around to watch the next episode. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.